In this video, I'm going to teach you how to use the fronds. Now, this fronds is the newer split barrier fronds. And the way that's going to work is you put your sample in up the ramp here, and just after it makes its way into the magnetic zone, the barrier disappears. So magnetics and paramagnetics will actually stay in their place, basically kind of levitating across that lack of a barrier, and all the non-mags will fall out and trickle down into the bottom tray. This is the latest and greatest. You might have the other one where there is no barrier, and it's the magnet's job to basically separate the two as it travels down the ramp. Pretty similar setup, but I'll be talking specifically about this type of a fronds. First thing you do with any fronds, if you're not the only one using this, and you know somebody else might have snuck in at the middle of the night, make sure you clean all the parts. Especially if you're trying to do analyses on minerals where any kind of contamination of somebody else's sample will screw you up. Make sure that everything is surgically clean. For this video, I'm gonna show you how to clean at the end of the video, but realize everything has been clean before I set it up. First thing we need is butcher paper. I like to think of the butcher paper almost like a safety net. To begin the setup, we slide the ramp in between the two magnetic poles. And you do that in the upper slot of the ramp. And then you put these little brass bolts into place. There's one at the top and the bottom. When you're installing this main brass chute, make double sure that you do not touch inside where the sample's traveling because just the grease from your fingers will create a barrier and then the sample won't flow smoothly. So if you watch the way I hold this when I installed it, I only hold the sides or maybe even touch that little groove in the middle, but never the bottom of that channel. Next step is to install our little fork chute. And for our lab, we have so much throughput that I made an aluminum shield that goes on top. So the way you hold this is you hold your chute, hold the shield on top of that, and then you can actually slide it onto the ramp and then the bolt goes through. This is an aluminum bolt. Make sure you don't over tighten this because it's a plastic chute thread. Whereas this up here, the original chute, you wanna make sure pretty tight because that's gonna be vibrating sometimes for hours, almost all day long. And if one of these comes loose and you're not paying attention, that chute can actually slide around. Next step is to install your two sample tin boxes. I like to make sure that the dark box is for the magnetics on the top chute and the non-anodized tin colored box is the one that goes down below for the non-magnetics. Gives me a reminder when I'm bagging each side of that sample. It looks simple, but if you're trying to wrestle with this, it can be hard. So you tip the box in, tip it up, and then you slide it into those clips. You can hear them sometimes snap into place. So you hold the spring out of the way, tip it under, bring it up, and then snap it into place. And then I like to press and make sure that it's not gonna rattle on that split chute. Because if you have it touching and once you turn this thing on, it just goes brah, rah, 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 all day long. It'll drive you nuts. And so you can see the forward tilt is set between 20 to 22 degrees and then the side tilt as well so here you can see that it's set at about 21 it can vary a little bit on your sample if it's super felsic and everything wants to fall out you might want to change that angle a little bit more shallow if it's super magnetic and nothing wants to fall out you might want to actually steepen that angle but if you're just wanting to keep this real simple for volunteers or whoever's running stuff Ours states that you want this side angle to be 23 and a half and this forward angle to be 20 degrees. Our little mini hopper for our sample, first thing you do is you want to take this little set screw and you want to put it in right there because that is going to be what holds our plastic shield into place. So this goes in the front of the system you don't want to tighten that all the way down yet. Now you have your little miniature ramp, and then you have the side shield that goes on the miniature ramp. So the way this is going to orient is it's going to basically go in the back there, 
but you want the profile to match the profile on the aluminum ramp. And so put your hinge screw through there, through the plastic. So once that's through the plastic, then you take your mini ramp and you can actually put that on the same system and you're going to thread it into the back of that hole right there. So can you see that? The back of that hole right there. The back of that hole right there. So you have your three things here on the ramp put together. You want them out of the way, so aiming down, and then you start the threading. And there you go. Once it's still loose, you push the plastic shield into place, you tighten that side set screw. And then what I like to do for this ramp is I like to swing it all the way closed. And then you're just swinging it open a little bit. So in the front, you want to see like just an eighth of an inch. Tighten the back, that little hinge screw. As tight as you can get it. And then you also have this little blocker thing in the front. And so what that does is that prevents too much sample from rushing out. So what you can do is you can put that into the front of this feed system. So there it is in the front of the feed system. And then you have, a, we have a set screw that's basically chrome plated, but it's still brass. And you get that thing started. So basically then you set that blocker in the front and then you can pull your actual ramp down so there's about maybe a sixteenth of a gap. So right there in the front you want to make sure there's just about a sixteenth of a gap. Any bigger in your sample will be just pouring out. And when I say sixteenth of a gap I mean sixteenth between this front basically barrier here and your dark anodized aluminum ramp. So make sure everything is as tight as you can get them and it's ready to install. So to do that, you slide it up into there and then I like to get it so it's about an eighth inch. You'll notice that I'm aiming the chute that way and that's because if there's any magnetite still in the sample or something that really wants to jump and stick to the magnet, this shuts it down. If you spun it and you aimed it that way, all of a sudden, magnetite would basically rip your sample out, spray it all over the place and make a mess. So i rather it shut the system down than accelerate the system and waste sample. When I do that, I make sure it's about an eighth inch above the ramp so it's not touching. And then I tighten this little set screw. And then once that set screw is tightened, I can then tighten this top one. Next thing I can do now that that's tightened up is I can put in the plunger and the funnel. So funnel goes on top first, then the plunger goes down through, and then you tighten this, there's a little wing nut that you then install and tighten on that plunger system. We found the plunger keeps everything from getting packed and locked up because it creates a little air space right above the mini ramp. So what I do is I pull this up, so we have a downward ramp on this bar here and then once that's tight then you can actually tilt this up just a little bit and that ensures that there's space for the sample to percolate around the plunger and then come out that mini ramp and then once the funnel's in place you can wrap that tape around leaving that little folded over piece at the end so your fronds probably came with a tube but we found it's such a fight to get that tube on and off, but just a piece of tape is real easy. And then when you want to unpeel it, you just find that flap, peel it slowly, and that way you're not in a big fight. Since we have so much throughput in our lab, I made a gigantic sample holder. And so if you would like to order one of these for your fronds, if you're running larger samples, click the screen right up here. Make sure you never run a sample through the fronds unless it's been passed over with a hand magnet. To do that, what you gotta do, to do that, you form basically a little paper boat. So you fold up 
different edges here. Do your little corners, make sure that they flare up. Make sure your sample is dry. You'll notice the sample's already been passed through a 450 micron sieve. And so what we do is we use a little Ziploc bag and basically a neodymium magnet from an old hard drive. Put that in the bag, that makes sure that there is no contamination. And then you just pass it back and forth over your sample. And what this does is this makes sure you get out all the magnetite so you can't foul up the fronds. Because if you don't do this step, all of a sudden the ramp will get clogged with magnetics. And so when that's done, it's up to you. You can either save these magnetics or toss them away. And now that's ready to put into the machine, into our feeder. Since this is a barrier of fronds, we have an external power supply. And on these, you always want to make sure that they're turned all the way down to zero before you turn them on or off, because that can cause a crazy surge and blow out the system. For ours, we just need to adjust the voltage. But I always make sure that's totally off before I turn the machine on. For ours, we just need to adjust the voltage. But I always make sure that's totally off before I turn the machine on. Once it's on, I can bring it up to the settings of what we want to run for magnetics. And for that, we're always going to be just looking at the voltage here. And since we're going to run this through all the levels, we're going to start at 0.3. And just like with the power supply, you also want to do the same thing on both the chute and the feed. So you spin the dials down to zero. You don't know what somebody did before you. They might have ramped it up because they didn't know that there was the surge clean out button. And so then once it's turned down to zero on the variable speed, Turn the system on, and then you can bring this up and watch the chute. And pretty much every time you pour a sample in, a little bit's gonna spit out, and that's just enough. You can actually see how the system feeds. Another great thing you should have while you're trying to adjust the feed is a nice strong LED flashlight, because that'll allow you to really see those sand grains, because the whole thing is pretty shadowy. And the way to adjust it is you're gonna look at this gap in our main chute, and you're gonna make sure that Everything is falling out in the first third to a half. You're getting no last minute fallout toward the end of that gap. If, you, if that's happening, you might be actually losing some non-mags because they're not able to actually trickle out of the sample before it goes back into that barrier. So here you can see a pretty good feed rate. This is a little aggressive, but you'll notice that almost everything's falling out here. We've got the shoot feed rate up to the way we want it. And now let's do the feeder to the way we want it. But remember, spin that dial to zero before you actually turn it on. Once it's on, watch it with the light and you can see exactly how much is coming out. So the feed rates really depend on how much non-mag versus magnetic material you have coming through the system. Okay, right there we now have the main chute feeding at a decent rate. You'll actually hear that some things are vibrating, so we want to go back and double check all of our little knobs. And maybe the, the trays here are rubbing. There we go, the vibration has gone down a bit. For each of the different settings, I like to have a little area on our butcher paper, so 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 1.0, a mat, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 1.0, and max. For this sample, it's GC101. So you put the sample name. Then you put the level at which you fronds it. So this is 0 
And then underneath that, it's also good to write every process that you put the sample through. So JC for jaw crush, PV for pulverizer, WT for water table, and then HM for hand mag. And you want to write them small so you can cut them out of like one small sheet of paper and so that they're not so big that they'll cover up the entire little glass sample. So I just go right down and do all the levels. Next thing, once you have your labels all written down, is you cut them out with a pair of scissors. So I like to cut them so you get them all cut like little flaps, and then voila, they're all done. And then with those, you're then gonna take pieces of tape and stick them on. And so you just stick it on like that, and then you grab your little jar, and you wrap it up, roll your label around it. Now the entire sample is run through 0.3 magnetics. Before you turn off the feeding system, you want to surge both things. So first, surge the feeder, and then surge the chute. And that will make sure that everything's been knocked off of both systems and it's all in those collection cups. Once you finish doing the surges, you first turn off the feeder and then you turn off the chute in that order and then you do the opposite when you're restarting. It's just good to set up a protocol because you don't want the feeder dumping all that sample into a chute that's not vibrating yet. Okay, to pull the sample out, we do just the opposite the way we put it in. So we're only loading the dark anodized box. These are all your magnetics that were placed at the top of the ramp. So I like to hold the jar flat down to the table, take the lid off, and then tap it so it, all the sample goes into down in the corner. And then here, because it's held on the table, everything's stable. And then you literally just tap the back of that tin and it'll all just dump right in. You gotta be careful, you wanna start with a low angle and then as you tap, steepen your angle. If it's too steep of an angle, it'll all dump in and it'll spill out. All right, so now all the magnetics are placed into their little sample vial. We can put this little tray back in and then the final thing you do is take the lower one, the non-anodized one, out. This will go back into the chute and be run through the next magnetic level. So for us, we've done 0.3. So we're going to put this in and ramp our magnet up to 0.5. So we turn up the voltage dial until we're at a current of 0.5. To make sure you retain all your sample back off of the fronds is to go through a whole purging sequence. So the first thing I like to do is purge the feeder so you can hear it vibrating a little extra. All this purge does is run maximum current into the vibrator. You want to make sure all the sample is poured out of it. You'll always have a little bit left on that little mini ramp. Then what's weird is zircon and other heavy minerals can actually work their way back up into recesses on that mini ramp. So I like to loosen the set screw and that little hinge on the mini ramp and then drop it down. And then once you've dropped it down, give it a couple flicks. I like to pick it up so that this doesn't drag on our nice chrome brass ramp. And that makes sure everything's off the plunger, off the walls, and finally, off of that little recess right behind the mini ramp. You'd be surprised at how many heavy minerals can actually work their way back up the ramp into these little recesses. Then once we're done with the feeder, we can turn that off and then we give the main ramp a couple purges. I like to do this to the eye of the tiger.
Once you've done the Eye of the Tiger beginning, you know that all the grains are off the main ramp. And you can actually see here that as the electromagnet has heated up, we've increased our resistance and therefore the current has gone down from 2.3 down to 1.91. So realize that if you're gonna let this thing run for hours, you're gonna lose that efficiency. On the max magnetic setting, you'll be removing the rest of the titanite and even zircon with either a high uranium concentration or with an iron oxide patina. And you'll be left with either barite, pyrite, kyanite, quartz, and most of your zircon. Finally label your non-magnetics. So sample name, and then NM for non-magnetic, and then we finished at 1.9 on the fronds. And since this is gonna go through MI and acetone, we're gonna lose this label. So I'm gonna label this after MI with all of the steps that we did on the other jars. And that's it for the whole process. We have 0.3 all the way up to the max setting. And then in our vial here, we have the non-magnetics. And this will then head over to the methyl iodide heavy liquid separation. The last step here is gonna to be to clean the machine. And in a laboratory, that is one of the most important steps to make sure that there's no contamination between samples. Our sample is now bagged and safe the magnet is still on for a very good reason. There's some magnetic minerals that have stuck to that top pull. We wanna make sure we don't shut the magnet off until we have some cup down here to catch that. You then slowly lower our current knob until it goes back down to zero. And when it does that, you might see some magnetics falling off onto this main tray. We then turn back on our chute I like to get a piece of weighing paper, and then I like to basically slide it along the top magnet pole, knock all that off. This is gonna make your job of cleaning it much easier. Finish with a purge. If you want, you can save what you captured into this cup, and now we can start cleaning. We have all of our parts now on that butcher paper that's got probably some sand on it. And using some sort of air, we have bottled air, which is kind of wasteful. If you have any kind of an air line or a compressor, pull off a nitrogen tank, whatever. I like to first blow everything off. So down below, so you're not blowing this stuff across the counter, but basically dust everything off that has come in contact with the sample. including our ramp. And I'm setting them on a part of the butcher paper that I know has no sand on it. And you can use two things to wash this with a liquid. You can either use an alcohol, which is pretty thick, it's like a syrup, or you can use acetone. But if you're gonna use acetone, you have to do it in the fume hood. Since I'm out here, I'm gonna use alcohol in our little bucket. If you use acetone, make sure that you do not spray the plastic parts with acetone. Those are the little shields around the sample feeder. You can tell that somebody has sprayed this little bugger with acetone. What happens is it clouds it and it makes it brittle. You spray it a couple times with acetone, it breaks, you're done. And that's why we made the top of the split chute out of aluminum because you can spray this all day with acetone, not a problem. But to be safe, I'm gonna just use alcohol on all these parts and on the entire fronds itself. The first little magnetic cup, spray it, tilt it down so everything runs out. Getting all the surfaces inside and out. So grab a new Kim wipe and wipe it down. Place this into the clean container. Now spraying the non-magnetic cup. And then wipe it down with a Kim wipe. And when you wipe it down with a Kim wipe, try and actually do it in a way that if there's anything left, you can get it out. Washing the chute, you want it tilted almost vertical, and you want to use the alcohol spray stream to actually help you do the cleaning. 
So you do the front, and you do the back, and then you thoroughly wipe it down with a Kim wipe, making double sure that you do not touch the ramp bare fingered. You do not want to get any finger oil on the ramp. Little ramp, same thing with the lower feeder unit. And you want to do this also tilted so everything quickly runs out. Our split chute, making sure to hose down every bit of the surface area, plunger, feeder funnel, spray it as hard as you can, throw it into the new parts bin. A split chute guard, dry it off, into the parts bin. A little guard for the feeder chute. Now that these are all dry, you can put them into the clean parts tray. First thing on the fronds is I want to hit it with some air. When you air this and wash it with a wet cloth, you want to make sure that you're working from the top down. Start with our feeder holder magnet, then work our way behind the two poles between the two poles, down the bracket, and then finally our little cup holder. When you're cleaning the main fronds, it's crucial that you only use either alcohol or something water-based with some soap. If you use acetone, you'll start stripping all the paint and actually start ruining the tape that's around the electromagnet. So don't use acetone. So we have a new Kim wipe. Spray it down with a little bit of alcohol or a Windex and then bunch it up so it fills that gap between the two plates and then run that wet rag through. And that first pass will tell you how dirty it is. This pretty much has nothing on it. So we know there wasn't a whole bunch of magnetics that stuck onto that plate. So fold it over again and do it. I then like to grab another Kim White, get it wet with alcohol or Windex or even soapy water and then I make a little plug out of it because on this lower pole along the fronds sometimes material can get down behind it and so I like to make the little plug that comes all the way through and then I look at it to make sure I didn't get a lot of sediment that was trapped behind this lower magnetic pole. Last step with this is with another wet Kim wipe is to wipe everything else down. So sides, the whole machine, feeder, to make sure if something's still there, I like to give it one last blast of air. Our fronds is now clean. Our parts tray's over there with everything clean. And we can finally get everything off the counter. Fold up the dirty butcher paper. Toss it and give the countertop a good rinsing. So wipe down the countertop and the base of the fronds. And then go over it with your hands to make sure you've gotten all the sediment so it just feels totally clean and smooth. Before we put the parts away, we want to wrap up our brass chute. So I like to take two Kim wipes. Since it doesn't fit in our clean parts tray, and you just fold it up like a little Christmas gift, or Hanukkah, depending on who you are. There's all of our parts, and these will go in the cabinet below. Put the dust cover on the fronds. And now let's head over to play with a little methyl iodide.